Welcome to the Diary of an Apartment Investor podcast. I'm your host, Brian Briscoe. I'm very excited for today's show. We've got none other than Sridhar Saniti today on the line with us. So Sridhar, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Uh, Thanks for inviting me to the podcast. Absolutely. Absolutely. So do us a favor and tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Hello. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, wherever you are, depending on what time you are listening to. My name is Sridhar Saniti. I came to United States in 95 as an IT professional, and I was in the IT industry for 30 plus years. And uh, past uh, few years, I have branched into commercial real estate. Prior to that, I was doing a single family type, mm-hmm. a single lot type of mm-hmm. transactions in real estate for more than 20 years. Uh, ever since I started in 2018, 2019 time frame, I have done uh, almost... Uh, 18 syndications, I would say, 18 nice. transactions. Um, nice. And then number of uh, deals wise, maybe 15 plus. Yeah. yeah, nice, nice. So you you started, you came over here uh, working in IT at first. What got you interested in real estate in general? Oh, that's a good question. Originally, I was planning to start an IT company. I did a couple of trials. Mm-hmm. Uh, every time I had... Uh, the product up to the MVP stage, partners start dropping off. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I realized that uh, instead of looking for partner, I should be able to fund the whole project. For that, I need to boost my net worth and uh, <laughs> cash yeah. flow situation. That's what motivated me to look for other alternatives where I can make money. Mm-hmm. And in that process, I was uh, looking to buy hotel, motel type of investments. Okay. So uh, I kept on exploring and I bumped into uh, an event uh, at one of the uh, IRA custodian companies. Mm -hmm. The presenter was uh, a multifamily uh, mentor. So Mm -hmm. I kind of liked that uh, market at that point in time and I wanted to test it out, whatever he's saying saying is correct or not. So I invested in a couple of deals as passively. Mm -hmm. Okay. And getting the checks and the next thing I knew is like, okay, this is a slow process. Let me speed up and go for active deals. And mm-hmm. it's an active sponsor. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So passive investor first, then active. When you started as an active investor, what was that experience like? What were some of the challenges you had and how did you overcome those? It, uh, yeah, definitely active sponsorship has a lot of things to look after when you do any active deals. First thing was, uh, I am new to that business, so I thought mm-hmm. I decided to partner with somebody who is experienced. Yep. So at that time, I met somebody at that event which, which I was referring to, and mm-hmm. I got excited. After that, I said, let us do a deal together with the other person who has done like a multifamily, so smaller size, like 30, 40 unit types. Yep. In that, let us pull up and go for 100 unit type of deals. Yeah, so, nice. So that was one thing, and but I was not sure whether I would be able to raise the money or not. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, I, I was committed. So and then yeah. the next thing we did is like we looked for a heavy value add property in a second mm-hmm. tier market, and we got that under contract. And then we had to raise one point two million dollars between three partners. So it's not a bad raise, you know, starting out. It still can be intimidating, you know, but uh, I think it's very attainable. Yeah. So my thought process was if I could not attract any investor, Mm -hmm. somehow I will liquidate my equity and everything and put my share of 400,000 into that deal. That was the thought process. Yeah. My surprise, I raised the most in that deal. Mm -hmm. Other partners, uh, one partner just put the minimum, but other things that I raised the most, yeah. Nice. Nice, nice. You thought the part of the challenge would be raising the money. You're able to get that one across the finish line. And has that deal come full cycle yet? Or do you guys still own that property? No, it's still, uh, we own that. Uh, we took care of the value add. But mm-hmm. the investors are going to get a decent return because we have been holding it for almost five years now. So Nice, nice. Any plans to sell it soon? Or do you guys like yes. uh, it long term? Yes. Once the market turns around right now, the interest rate my, uh, interest yeah. rates are high. So once the interest yeah goes down a little bit, then cap will compress. And yeah. 
will give a better return for investors. Yeah, I, I've, got, I've got a couple of properties that are doing well right now, and we're just we're just waiting for a better time. I think I think that's uh, that's smart. I think a lot of people who would normally be sellers right now are doing the same thing. So, well, cool. So, how did it progress from there? You said you've been in 18. You know, did you kind of progressively go bigger and bigger on the sizes, stay the same, or how did that look? So, after that first transaction, I got a lot of uh, courage and <laughs> boost and said, okay, let me go for a little bigger and better and faster. So, yeah. that year we closed four deals. The next one is a 200 unit one. One nice. Day. So nice. Now you're in Dallas right now. Were you at da- also in Dallas when you started? Yes. Okay. And where did you guys decide to buy multifamily? So mostly in the Dallas uh, suburbs. Um, mm-hmm. The first few days I wanted to be uh, like close to the place where I live. So mm-hmm. within two hour radius, two hour driving distance, mm-hmm. uh, we picked the properties. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a that's a good way to do things. There's, there's something about focusing, you know, whether it's geographically or property type. You know, I think it all works, but you know, something about focusing on a smaller area. I like that idea personally. So, so you said two hour drive from where you're at was kind of your your radius. Yes. Okay. Now, can you get everywhere in the Dallas metro within two hours? Yes. Okay, got it, got it. I, I've been to Dallas a couple of times, and I know it's large, you know, wide, wide open spaces. But so, I mean, out of those deals, you know, you guys normally do value add deals. What's a standard deal look like for you? So, the, the, the typical uh, deal is like 200, mm-hmm. 200 plus units. Okay. Um, we prefer two people in the office and two people outside. That we will have more continuous support mm-hmm. for the tenants. So, two hundred plus units, nineteen. 85 built now. At that time, uh, we opted for a little older age, like 1970s also. Mm-hmm. Now, now it is 1985 or later. 60,000 median household income type of okay. in neighborhoods. Okay. What's a 200 unit apartment cost in Dallas nowadays? So, depending on the suburb, um, if the median household income is high, mm-hmm. it may cost 1980s product, may cost like 150 range mm-hmm. per door. Okay. Uh, if it is uh, sixty thousand million household income, then it may cost anywhere from hundred ten to hundred thirty. Okay. So, so two hundred units. You're looking, you know, twenty in, in the twenties, between twenty and thirty million on average. Yes. Yes. Oh, awesome. Awesome. When you're putting together the uh, the money for this, I assume you guys are taking out debt. Where do you like to come in on debt? Are you uh, do you guys come in since you're doing value adds? Are you doing bridge debt on these? Or are you permanent debt? How do you guys like to finance? Initially, we all uh, used the permanent debt that was the popular product at then, and later <laughs> on, the bridge debt became more popular when uh, interest rates started going up. Okay, awesome. Now you you mentioned we we talked about that first one specifically. You know you're saying you're still holding on to that one. I think you said you you're you've done eighteen to date. How many of the eighteen are you guys still managing right now? So uh, there's eighteen transactions, but there are some construction ones also. Mm-hmm. So uh, the existing ones right now eight deals. Three went full cycle. Besides this eight, total eleven were existing properties. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, having full cycle deals is always fun. You know, it's uh, sometimes I, I don't know. I, I fall in love with properties, so sometimes selling properties is not uh, not the funnest thing to see because it's like, dang, we're losing one. But it's still fun to exit, and I mean, especially if you've made a little bit of money, put some money in your pocket too. So. Yep. Well, cool. So you're in Dallas, you're operating in Dallas. Any ambitions for other cities? Are you guys going to stick with Dallas for a while? No, but later on, um, some of the deals I bought in other cities too, in this okay. portfolio. I, um, I do have properties in Austin, Houston, mm-hmm. Memphis. Uh, basically, we expanded our search to entire uh, um, down south um, mm-hmm. Sunbelt mm-hmm. areas. All right. Yeah, a lot a lot of people are really really high on the Sun Belt right now. So, lots of good stuff happening in there. Well, that's cool. Like on the deals that are outside the Dallas Metro, what's what's your role in those deals? Are you do you have the same role on everything or are you kind of Yeah, so most of the deals I do nowadays I'm the lead GP and then uh, I do uh, for the remote ones, right? I won't be the boots on the ground, but I visit the property mm-hmm. every month or every other month even though they are out of sale. Okay. How much time do you spend on the road then with uh, properties in other cities? 
So, I mean, every week I visit some property. Mm-hmm. Okay. Nice, nice, nice. How do you uh, go about choosing which market you're going to buy properties in? Basically, I look for the median household income as a first uh, screening criteria, 60,000 plus. And then uh, employment growth, uh, minimum 1%. Job growth, minimum 1%. For larger cities, for okay. smaller cities, if the population is 100,000 or less, right? I look for 2% job growth rate. Okay. Why income and why job growth rate? What's uh, What about those metrics really uh, caught your attention? If that market attracts new jobs, right, obviously that will attract more tenants there. And when uh, people move into those areas, first thing they do is they stay in an apartment complex and see if that is a place where they want to buy the house or not. So first one or two years, they will stay in the apartment. Even if they move out to a house, single family house, um, someone else will move in because of the job growth. So more people will move into that neighborhood, right? Okay. Personally, I like the job growth uh, stats as well. You know, areas with high job growth are typically going to have people moving in, like you say, and um, more people moving in leads to higher demand, higher rent prices, higher, higher property values. So uh, that's what's one of my favorite stats to to look at as well as, you know, where where's the job growth and you know how strong is that going to be? So usually that they are correlated with less crime also. It is. Yes, it is. Higher income is also correlated with with lower crime as well um, in a lot of cases. So, yeah, good stats there. Now, I mean, you look at median income, 60,000 and above, you know, are, are you typically doing B class, A class? What's uh... B, B class um, and then E minus. OK. And for uh-huh. construction, I go for A plus. OK. So you like kind of like B, B up to A minus on purchasing of existing but mm-hmm. you build a plus is what you're saying. Yep. Right. How many projects have you built to date? No, it's still going on. Nothing has completed. So the first batch is still going on. Okay. Interesting. Where, where is that? Sorry, I maybe I missed it. In Dallas suburbs only. In Dallas suburbs only. But, but we, first project, we bought the entire land and then we were building it. And the second one, we got the raw land and got the entitlements done. Mm-hmm. So now we need to build it. Third one is also the same thing. Entitlement process is going on. Um, mm-hmm. Fourth is the landlord. So okay. single families. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So looking into the future, you know, what's what are your plans for the future? I and mean, what's next for you and your, your company? Challenges I faced right now. Some of them had I known certain things in advance, I would have avoided it. Mm-hmm. So for future, I'm creating a fund. So that fund gives the flexibility for the investors to put in the money. And if they don't want to stay in the project, they can exit out. That flexibility I'm planning to give. Okay. okay. And then uh, if they want a steady stream of income, they can come into a debt fund. And then uh, in our structuring, right, pretty much every deal, we put some debt structure into it and then uh, remaining equity. Okay. Yeah, interesting. You know, I, I like the fund idea. How are you going to manage it so that people can can exit if they want to exit? I mean, you need to maintain... I guess a little bit of liquidity for that one, but you know, real estate deals aren't always liquid. What's what's your plan on that one? So that is the reason I have a debt fund. So yeah. we throw the debt and then buy this equity share and we'll pay back the debt as we borrow from that one. Yeah. Okay. All right. Interesting. Interesting. Well, cool. So how about this? If you had some advice for somebody who's newer to the business, what would that advice be? First, they need to get themselves educated with the basic terminology. Um, and then they need to see who would be their partners because a multifamily business is a team sport. It's not a sole uh, enterprise. So you need to work with multiple uh, vendors, multiple uh, other partners like lenders, lawyers, at, I mean, attorneys, and then um, brokers to get the deals. And then yeah. property managers, asset managers, all these people, I think you need to build the team so mm-hmm. the moment you decide to get into this business you should start networking with people mm-hmm. understand uh, what exactly you can uh, do and then un- assess one's strengths like one, one not everybody is in, good in everything uh, so yeah. you need to assess what they are good at and how they can uh, get the complementary skills for the areas where they are not good at build the team and start pursuing and uh, don't uh, 
don't spend too much time on analysis paralysis take action and then mitigate the risk so um, there is always risk in any investment so mm -hmm. one has to mitigate it and then get it out yeah okay well uh, if you mind i don't want to ask some follow ones on that you say mitigate risks so find find partners build your team you know um take action and and then mitigate risks so on the risk mitigation, you know, where do you think the biggest risks are in these multifamily deals? And how, how do you go about mitigating them? Yeah, and in the deal life cycle, uh, you have risk exposure in every area, mm -hmm. right from the partnership, right? If you don't find the right partner, right, then uh, the deal can be in a stressful situation down the road. Initially, when they um, buy it, right, everybody gets excited to acquire the property. Yeah. Everybody will uh, up their sleeves and then do the acquisition. After that, slowly, some of the partners may disappear from meetings and all that. So, yeah. so that's why you need to find the right partner for commit, uh, with mm -hmm. commitment. That is a risk. If you cannot uh, spare the time and, and then you get into the project, then investors' money is at risk. It's severe uh, risk, right? Yeah. So how do you go about, you know, finding partners and then vetting them to make sure they're the, the type that are going to stick with it? So um, obviously uh, networking uh, in uh, real estate events, because uh, typically people who are interested in real estate, they come to those events. So that's the first screening, right? Uh, rather than picking somebody you know, from outside social world. Yeah. So, who maybe having high ambition to do the business but when it comes to reality they may not be ready yet mm -hmm. so you need to go to those events and start networking with them and then see what their uh, policies are what are what their priorities are in this whole uh, business and mm -hmm. how their ethics are integrity wise etc so mm -hmm. it's like people tend to show the true colors later on <laughs> initially they may, it's it's not easy to find initially so yeah. give some time to understand the other partner. So I've done a mm -hmm. mistake in a couple of cases where I did not pick the right partner. I'm ending up uh, spending a lot of time in those deals. So yeah, so that is, that's why it's very important to pick the right partner and then think in the long term uh, whether their priorities are aligned with your priorities. Yeah, you know, and I, I mean, I, I got into a partnership. We did a lot with, with the partnership. I mean, we did a lot of good stuff and, you know, made, made a lot of money, but it didn't last long. Let's put it that way. It didn't last yeah. long. And, you know, we split, um, ended up splitting up. But uh, making sure you have good partners, I think, is absolutely crucial going forward on that. And also, smaller teams are better. And uh, partners, the real good financial strength is very important in these deals because when uh, crisis comes, the first thing usually you need is the cash, right? So one should be able to support the deal. I mean, you cannot depend on the capital call all the time and then investors yeah. will not be happy if you do multiple capital calls or even if you do a capital call. So. Yeah. So this is uh, another thing. Uh, people with financial strength is very important. Uh, as far as the uh, brokers go, so you need to find the right broker who understands what you are looking for and then help you in uh, acquiring the property rather than somebody who tries to push the deal for closing <laughs> purposes and then uh, getting you the wrong deal. So that, that is another thing we need to be very cautious on the risk side. And lending-wise, uh, you need to be very thorough on what uh, are the covenants of the loan or terms of the loan are and mm -hmm. making sure that you are not signing up something that you are not sure of. A lot of people are uh, like, uh, when they get the loan, they don't pay too much attention to uh, yield maintenance, deficiency, uh, yeah. all those things, right? You know, yeah. So if one is not knowledgeable in that area, they better get some uh, professional help to review the loan agreement yeah absolutely absolutely yeah i mean there there's a lot to be said about you know making sure you have a really good solid team and somebody on the team needs to know how to do every aspect of it you yeah know, not everybody needs to be smart in every area but somebody on the team like how you said you know if you don't have somebody who's smart on it you can still go out and you know find professionals you know somebody else to, to review it or whatnot but yeah well cool cool well, awesome. Well, let's wrap things up. How can people get to know you better or, you know, connect with you? 
Yeah, my <clears throat> website is growwealth2retire.com. Growwealth2retire.com. Simple to remember. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, my email address is Sridhar, my first name, at growwealth2retire.com. Awesome. And we'll put uh, the website and the email address in the show notes. So if, yeah. if you're listening and you want to contact Sridhar, just go to the show notes and click uh, click one of the links. So. Well, Sridhar, thanks for thanks for coming on the show today. Very much appreciate your time. Thanks for having me on the show. Awesome. Yeah.